Well, it's uh, my great pleasure to uh, welcome you now to an international session uh, uh, connecting Moscow uh, with Harvard University. And we're very fortunate uh, to have with us today uh, two leaders from uh, Moscow, uh, Alex Lupin and Olga Puzinova, uh, who will talk to us uh, on the issue of uh, with it, whether completing the Russia uh, Chinese uh, border issues can be useful for dealing with the Russia Japanese issues. Uh, now that we're in a Zoom era, uh, it makes it much easier for us to connect uh, with Russia. We were hoping that Alex and Olga were going to be here in person, uh, but then <clears throat> with coronavirus, we had to uh, transport them. Uh, let them uh, return to uh, be in Moscow and get to us by Zoom. Uh, I would like to start off today by welcoming the director of the Fairbank Center, uh, Mike Zoni, who's been a great supporter of our series and of the programs of uh, Fairbank Center. I would like to say a few words on behalf of the Fairbank Center. Uh, Mike, it's yours. Thanks very much, Ezra. Uh, we can hear me? Yes. Great. Um, thanks, Ezra. Ezra asked me uh, to, uh, to say a few words, and I'm actually really happy that he did. Uh, I just want to just take a moment uh, to, uh, first of all, say hello to the Fairbanks Center community. Uh, ordinarily, we would be uh, meeting in person with sort of end of semester events. Uh, and since that's not happening, I thought this would be a good chance just to give my best wishes to all of you uh, uh, for continued health uh, continued good spirits and uh, for good good wishes to manage as best we can in these difficult circumstances. Uh, I also want to uh, say a really heartfelt thank you to uh, Ezra Vogel, to Bill Shao, and to Bill Overholt, the coordinators of the Critical Issues in Contemporary China series. They were very, very quick to respond to the uh, demands of this complicated circumstance situation. And, and recognizing how important these programs are to work with us to, to get them online. Uh, and I also especially want to thank the Fairbanks Center staff, in particular, Mark Brady and Nick Drake, who have really gone above and beyond to sort out the technical issues uh, that make events like today possible. Um, we are trying to uh, move as much programming online uh, as possible. These are uh, difficult times, but certainly important times for uh, public engagement on China, on the U.S.-China relationship, on Chinese responses to COVID-19, uh, and so on. And you can look forward to uh, a busy summer of online programming from the Fairbanks Center uh, in collaboration with other centers at Harvard and beyond. Uh, one of the, Olga was just saying that, that we can't, it's not quite the same as meeting in person but one of the nice things about technology is that it does allow us to address a larger group, address a larger audience. Uh, Olga and Alex just got off a, a Zoom conference with a speaker from Australia. I just got off uh, a, a webinar in Beijing. Um, so we're able to, to communicate more globally as a result of the use of technology. We're also able to communicate to a much larger audience uh, and the, the very large audience for previous Fairbank Center events has really been very heartening. In addition to saying hello and giving my best wishes to our, our community, I also want to welcome uh, new viewers who are joining us uh, virtually for the first time and, and hope that you will continue to uh, participate in our, in our programs as they develop. Uh, these really are, as I said, uh, difficult and challenging times where knowledge about China and knowledge about China's role in the world is, is just so important. We're happy to do our bit to draw together experts and get them in conversation with one another. Uh, and so we hope that, uh, that you will appreciate this and benefit from this and join us. Um, the, uh, uh, that's all I want to say. I am so looking forward to uh, uh, hearing uh, Alex and Olga speak to us from Moscow. Let me now turn things back to uh, Ezra to give them a, a formal introduction. Once again, uh, uh, please, uh, on behalf of the whole Fairbanks Center team, uh, accept my, uh, my best wishes for, uh, for good health 
and uh, continued engagement with the important work we're all doing to better understand China. Thanks, Ezra. Thank you so much, Mike. I think those of us at the Fairbank Center and somebody like me who's been around for a long time realizes how lucky we are to have Mike Zoni uh, and assisted by Dan Murphy running the Fairbank Center. Uh, he, M Mike is a, a fine historian of the Ming Dynasty especially, but also with great deep interest in the contemporary field. So we're very lucky to have his uh, support for the program. Uh, there's also today uh, kind of an Oxford connection uh, because uh, our speaker, Alex uh, Lucan, got his PhD at Oxford. Uh, and Olga is just competing her PhD at Oxford. And Mike Zoni got his PhD at Oxford. So uh, we are, we're linking Oxford and Moscow and uh, Harvard uh, today. The first time I visited the Soviet Union uh, was 1980. It had been Fairbanks' idea to keep very much in touch with the scholars of China around the world. And he made a special point of trying to keep in touch with the leaders uh, of uh, <clears throat> Chinese studies and felt it was very important. But those days, we operated by mail uh, before uh, the uh, internet, uh, didn't have Zoom. And I think it's a really a great advance that we will be able to realize with Zoom a kind of dream of having closer cooperation between scholars of China around the world. And I think we're very fortunate for that. The first time I visited the Soviet Union was 1980. And at that time, uh, uh, Bob Scalapino uh, and uh, Primakov, uh, Jeannie uh, Primakov, uh, had a, an annual uh, session where they invited a number of uh, Russian and a number of American scholars together working on Asia to begin to exchange views. And I was privileged to be part of that in 1980. And there uh, I met a, a young uh, scholar, one young scholar named Vladimir Lukin, who was very promising. I, I thought that uh, he was uh, very open and uh, one of the bright young stars. And then he went on uh, to be uh, ambassador to the United States and also head of the Foreign Policy Committee uh, of the Duma. And he had a son named Alex, and he wanted to make sure that Alex got very good training in Asian studies. And Alex indeed did. Uh, he uh, studied uh, in Moscow, got a PhD there. Uh, he got a PhD at Oxford. Uh, and he uh, spent, uh, got an MA at the Kennedy School. And so we were very privileged to have him at Harvard. And he is now a key link between uh, Asian studies in Russia and the rest of the world. And we're, we feel very fortunate that he was willing to take the time uh, to join us today. The topic uh, we, we're working on today is the experience of uh, Russia and China working over the border <clears throat> and how that might affect uh, or be a model for the relations that, and discussions that Russia and Japan are having over their border issues. So without further ado, Alex, it's yours. Ezra, I'd like to jump in just briefly to describe okay, the- Okay, well, I'm sorry. I meant to, Mark, I should have called on you to explain how we'll do the question period. Yes, Mark. Um, uh, so, so- I mean, Alex, Alex. If, yes, I, yes. If, if, ahead, if you've all joined us before for critical issues, um, you're aware of how we do questions and answers. Um, if you have a question, please submit it via, via the Q&A box, which should be in your menu bar for Zoom. Um, if you have questions during the talk, please feel free to send them. Otherwise, um, you can send them during the Q&A section. Uh, if you wish, you can send questions anonymously. If not, please provide your name and any affiliation that you have. Um, and I'll read that out as I read the question. Uh, we usually get more questions than we can ask in, in the allotted time. Uh, so my apologies if we don't get to your question. We'll be kind of just picking them randomly from um, the total ones that come in. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Nick. And now, Alex, it's all yours. Yes, thank you very much. It's a great honor to be a speaker at Fairbank Center. I have not met Professor Fairbank, but I remember that his book, The Chinese World Order, was the major book that I used uh, 
for my um, graduation thesis in university. Also, I met some other people whom Professor Vogel mentioned, like uh, Robert Scalapino. Once even met him in, in Lhasa, I remember. So uh, let me tell you some things about our, the idea of our talk. Um, first, we are not going to speak about about the pandemic, not because not not because we are not interested in it, but because we prepared it before it, and we wanted to present it in person. Uh, but we decided to do it now because, you know, such various unlucky circumstances should not infringe our or some, some, somehow block our academic activities, I think. So we should disregard them and, and go on. Uh, so the, the idea is that our idea was to study uh, if the uh, experience of solving of Russian Chinese or before that Soviet Chinese or before that again Russian Chinese uh, territorial dispute uh, uh, which was being there for more than a hundred years uh, and finally was solved in two th into 2004 if it could be a model for solving uh, other territorial disputes namely in this case uh, Russian-Japanese uh, territorial dispute, or at, or at least suggest some some ideas for solving other, other territorial dis disputes. So for, uh, first I'm going to uh, talk about uh, Sino-Russian border dispute settlement uh, and uh, suggest some ideas or lessons of it. And then Olga, who is a uh, an expert on Japan is going to talk about uh, Russian-Japanese dispute and and, and and the possibility of using this Russian-Chinese experience. So here you see the map of the two countries. Uh, let's see. Uh, this is the map of uh, what it says, Manjuria, Soviet Union uh, boundary, but it's, well, you can call it China, uh, but uh, at that time when the map was, uh, was, was done, it was, it, it, it was Manjuria, Manjuria, probably Manjougo, but it doesn't matter because it shows the two major uh, pieces of land that were acquired by the Russian Empire in the 19th century in the second half, according to Aigun Treaty and Beijing Treaty. Well, this uh, uh, like grayish part is the Aigun Treaty and uh, the red or pink part is when Vladivostok is the, the city of Vladivostok. The, the, this part uh, was acquired by Russia uh, uh, in uh, 1860, uh, according to Beijing Treaty, well, you can it you can say that it was acquired from China or not. It was Qing Empire at that time, so this this part actually was not uh, part of, uh, for example, Min China, but it was part of Manchurian. Uh, well, the Manjurians say, say used, used to claim that it was uh, kind of their territory, but because the, there was no a concept of border or clear concept of border at that time, it, it's, it's, it's not very clear. But anyway, the, Russia acquired it from, from somebody, let's say. Uh, this is the picture, actually a Chinese picture of signing uh, the Treaty of Beijing in 1860. So you see all this bad foreigners here. Um, uh, and this is the map. Unfortunately, I couldn't get it in color because it's about the so-called red line. So what is the red line, uh, which became the major problem be between the two countries? 
uh, uh, the uh, treaty itself did not uh, well it, it it talked about the border but it didn't say uh, where the border exactly was M namely it didn't say which bank of the river or where in the river or the two rivers the border was so it only said that the border was the, uh, that the two rivers uh, were the border the Amur or Helunjang river and the river of Argun but uh, it was it was also uh, drawn or somebody drew on uh, a red line on the map which was on the Chinese bank so Russians after that claimed that this was the real board on the Chinese bank and the Chinese position was that the this red line was not part of the treaty so the border should be somewhere uh, between the Russian and Chinese and Chinese bank uh, so the delimitation of the border, which started immediately after signing the, the treaty, was not completed by 1917, uh, before, before the revolution in Russia happened. Uh, after that, this were very kind of unstable time in both Russia and later the Soviet Union and China. So during this unstable times, the Soviet Union took effective control of the river uh, and the islands of the river, claiming that the actual border was the Chinese bank uh, on the Amur Helunjiang River and the Usuri, which is the Chinese name here. Uh, and uh, so later when communists came to power, uh, before communists came to power, China was too busy with many things and various Chinese governments were too busy to have to border talks. Uh, but uh, after communists came to power in China, the relations with the Soviet Union were very good. So first decade, they were, they were not ready to have any talks about, uh, about border issues. But later when relations became worse, um, uh, the Chinese side put, uh, well, decided to put some questions to the Soviet side, and in 1964, the border talks began. And it is interesting that already then, during the first uh, period of the talk, in 1964, not many people know that, the Soviet Union already agreed to the Salweg principle which means that the border is not the Chinese bank, but uh, the middle or, of the primary navigate, uh, na uh, navigable channel or, 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 or the waterway, which is, well, in, inside the river. It could be in, in the middle of the river. It depends on where the waterway is, but it's surely not uh, either Russian or Chinese bank. And this was the most usual, usually used uh, international principle, but not the only one, because there are various, various kinds of settlements. But the Soviet Union basically agreed on that. Uh, but unfortunately, the talks collapsed because of Mao Zedong made a famous statement uh, during, well, not during the talk, but at the time of the talks. And uh, when he met a Japanese delegation of, a Jap of the Japanese Socialist Party, famously said that the Ch Soviet Union has not paid the check for uh, you know, getting uh, China's territory in the 19th century. So it was not a direct uh, claim on the Soviet territory, but kind of uh, a hint that such a claim can be made. And uh, Khrushchev, the Soviet leader at that time, was very angry and he stopped the talks. So basically the, talk, the talks collapsed. collapsed. Uh, so the situation was very interesting. That on the one side, the Soviet Union basically agreed on the Chinese, on the Chinese demand, but because the talks collapsed, uh, there was no way 
of uh, doing the delimitation of going ahead with the delimitation of the new border line, which led to clashes. And the famous clash one on, was on Damansky Island. There were other clashes, uh, or Jen, Jen Bao Dao in Chinese. Uh, there were other clashes in Kazakhstan, but because Kazakhstan now is Russia, is not Russia, it's not that rel uh, relevant for us. Uh, and uh, uh, so this is the this is the picture of uh, Damansky or Jane Baudau Island. So you can see that actually the clash was ex absolutely unreasonable. It is very clear from this picture that it, it should have gone to China anyway. Because if you say that uh, the board is somewhere in the middle of the river, it surely should go to China. And the Soviet Union basically agreed to that. So if it was not for Mao Zedong and the um, talks continued, the agreement could have been reached already in the 1960s. But for political reasons, it could not happen. So, this, so the Soviet Union effectively controlled this island and Chinese wanted to get it and it led to uh, to clashes. Here you see on the other map where, where it actually situated. Uh, uh, so here you see on these pictures the Chinese uh, troops which were trying to get the island from, from the Soviet Union and you see the Russian troops. These are very interesting wooden forks that the Russian border guards used at first because there were no shooting at the first stage in, uh, in early March uh, 1969. So they kind of pushed them with, uh, pushed the Chinese, uh, true, uh, ch Chinese soldiers from the, from the Russian territory with these forks. Uh, something similar happened in uh, in Bhutan and uh, not long ago, but without the forks, it was like pushing battle. But then it came to shooting, finally. And here the, you see a Soviet tank captured, uh, and the uh, BM twenty one uh, Gred uh, rocket launcher, which was actually a secret weapon, and the Soviet Union used it for the first time. Uh, uh, during this clash. Uh, so because Soviet Union had, of course, a superiority and in, in, uh, military superiority, the uh, clashes did not uh, lead to any result for China, but there were casualties. Uh, the Soviet Union lost uh, 58 people, uh, people, this official figure. Here you see the funeral of them, which was a big event in the area. And here are the, these are Chinese soldiers. Uh, and very brave before the battle, you see it says, It's a fine dung pai. Uh, so all, all the Counter, uh, counter revolutionary forces uh, are paper tigers, reactionary forces. Sorry. So, uh, but here you see the the grave uh, of Chinese heroes. We don't know. Perhaps some of these people are lying there. We don't. Uh, there is no exact figure of Chinese casualties, but, but some, but their estimates is it's something between 100 and 300 casualties. Uh, so in 1969, so, uh, Soviet Prime Minister Kasigin uh, famously stopped at Beijing airport and had talks with uh, Zhou Enlai, uh, Prime, uh, uh, Prime Minister of China. And they agreed on ceasefire and basically easing of tensions at the board. And a new round of talks started, but because of uh, bad relations between two countries, uh, nothing happened during these talks. 
um, until the normalization of relations. So between 69 and late, uh, uh, and late 80s, of, of course, a lot of things happened. First, China began normalization with the United States and called for a united front against China and because of the, uh, against the Soviet Union. And because of that, of course, uh, relations even worsened and talks also formally were going on. They could not lead to any, any positive result. Then, uh, but in 82, China launched independent foreign policy, became kind of, uh, uh, the idea was that it was not uh, trying to form a united front against anybody. And uh, because of that, relations with the Soviet Union, with Moscow, began to improve. Uh, uh, also, at that time, China put three big obstacles as a precondition to normalization with the, uh, with the Soviet Union. These th three obstacles were uh, the uh, deployment of Soviet troops in Mongolia, uh, the excessive militarization uh, of uh, the Soviet-Chinese uh, border, and China demanded demilitarization of it, uh, and uh, the Soviet support of, uh, uh, of Vietnam and Vietnamese occupation of uh, Kampuchea at that time. Uh, Afghanistan, uh, the Soviet um occupation of afghanistan or invasion of afghanistan was was another obstacle you might call it fourth obstacle uh so uh at the same time uh in the uh, because uh, of a new course uh, of beijing foreign foreign policy the border was slowly opened and there were some exchange of goods and three big obstacles after Gorbachev came to power were removed, not because Gorbachev was making concessions specifically to China, but because this was kind of in line with his general policies. So between 88 and 99, the cross-border commerce between Russia and the Heilongjiang province increased threefold and the number of legal Chinese workers uh, in Russia increased to 18,000, so the bilateral trade and economic cooperation was growing. In 89, Gorbachev famously went to China, met Deng Xiaoping, and uh, Deng Xiaoping also said that we should close the, uh, close down the future, forget about, uh, uh, forget about the past and open a new, a new perspective for our relations. Uh, when the Soviet Union collapsed after some hesitation in the early ni uh, 90s, uh, the, cooperation norm uh, the cooperation between Russia and China continued. Here we, I just listed several important agreements. There were more, of course, at that time. For example, agreement on border management system uh, intended to facilitate border trade and hinder criminal activity was signed in 94. There was an agreement on confidence building measures, actually two agreements of uh, 96 and 97, which led to the demilitarization of border. Uh, then a joint declaration on a multipolar world and the establishment of a new uh, international order was signed in 97, which showed that Chinese China's and Russia's worldview were, were becoming similar. There were, uh, there were similar positions on regional conflicts. Shanghai Cooperation Organization was formed in 2001, which became a platform to this, uh, of uh, discussion and coordination of the policies of the two countries in Central Asia. In, uh, by uh, 2003, China became Russia's fourth trading partner, and Russia the eighth partner of China. Bilateral trade quadrupled from uh, five million, uh, for about $6 billion to more than 21. 
Finally, in 2001, a framework treaty of good neighbor neighborliness and friendly cooperation was signed. So according to this treaty, the strategic cooperative relations of good uh, neighborliness, friendship and cooperation were established. Uh, both countries agreed that they did not have any territorial claims. It expanded and deepened confidence building measures and uh, many other things. So, uh, against this, uh, that be, uh, this uh, background, a uh, Sino-Soviet agreement on the eastern part of the border was signed in 91, in May 91, just be before the, Soviet, the collapse of the Soviet Union. So the Thalweg principle was again confirmed. Uh, islands between the Thalweg line and the Chinese bank were transferred to China or were bound to transform to China. Freedom of navigation in the bordering rivers, the border rivers, Amur, Helundian, Usuri, Usulidian in Chinese, and Tuman, Tumandian, uh, was established. Uh, and the only problem which was left unsolved was the problem of three disputed islands, uh, which are Balshoi, Usuriski, and Tarabarov in the Amur River and Balshoi in the Argun River. So this is the picture of how Jin Bao Dao or uh, formerly Damansky Island looks, looks now. It's absolutely Chinese. We have this uh, Chinese buildings and Chinese uh, probably passport you know, or some other control. Uh, so Jin Bao Dao went to China. And now we come to the 2004 solution. Uh, it took from 19... Uh, 91 to 2004, 13 more years, just to discuss these three islands that were left. And here we can see a Russian and Chinese islands. Uh, they were basically, there is a general idea that they were divided 50-50, but that's, uh, but that's uh, uh, not exactly correct because there were really tough talks on every square kilometer. So we can see that uh, the uh, two islands, uh, well, one island went completely to China uh, and uh, another, other two were divided. So Tarabarov Island, 80 kilometers, square kilometers, uh, uh, and uh, went to China and uh, one 174, this is the biggest, uh, this Bolshoi Surinsky Island, the Bolshoi Surinsky Island, the biggest part of it went to Russia, which is 164 kilometers, but 80 square kilometers of it, plus the entire smaller island of Tarabarov, which is 43, uh, went to China, which is a bit less than 174. And why is that? Because another island, uh, the, uh, the third island, which is Balshoi Island and the Argun River was divided and the largest part of it uh, went to China. You see uh, five, uh, 57 square kilometers and, and, and a bit more uh, went, uh, went to, uh, 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 were divided between the two countries. 34 went to China and 23 went to Russia. So it's about 50-50, uh, but not exact. Uh, the talks were tough, and here the, these are pictures of uh, these divided islands, the Bolshoi Surisky Islands, or Heisyadze in Chinese. This you see Russian part, Chinese part, Russian bridge, and Chinese bridge. Chinese bridge, of course, looks more impressive, but Russian bridge is also not, not that bad. 
So here I come to some conclusions. Well, first, the territorial solution became the result of the general improvement of relations, not the other way around. Second, talks were going for a long time, four decades from 64, and brought results only when relations became close, while the territorial issue turned into a minor Uh, when, when the territorial issue turned into an, a minor unwanted obstacle on the way of further cooperation. So it is probably difficult to uh, solve such a big issue first, but when it becomes a minor obstacle, both countries decide to solve it somehow. So every time relations improved, it, has positive, uh, it had positive influence on border talks. But every time relations worsened, the talk stalled, and it had never, it of course had negative impact on them. But when we compare both situations with Japan, of course, there are also several differences. First, Russian Chinese dispute as a result of a long history of relationship, while the Russo Japanese dispute as a result of the Second World War. China was an ally of the, of the Soviet Union and Japan was an enemy. Uh, second, uh, Japan is a, close ally of the, uh, is a close ally of the United States uh, and China, well, was close at the time to the United States, but it has, no, uh, has never been an ally of the United States. Uh, third, the Southern Kuril Kurils or Northern Territories have significant Russian population, while those disputed islands between Russia and China did not have population, a uh, permanent population at all, just several duchies of some leaders, of local leaders. Uh, then uh, fourth, since Russia clearly stressed that the islands belong to its territory, in case of a compromise settlement, it cannot claim That it, uh, uh, that it is not transferring territory to Japan, but just delimiting the border. In the case of China, the Russian position was that it were not actually talks on the border, but on the delimitation of the border. Uh, in, in, Japan, in the Japanese case, it would be very difficult to claim that because the border is very clear where it is now. So, and also there was a war between the USSR and Japan, There have never been border clashes between the two countries, just like the clashes we saw in uh, in Jain Baudao, or on Jain Baudao or in Kazakhstan. So I'll stop here, and now Olga is going to continue. Thank you very much. Um, may I ask you to continue shifting the? <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> thank you but very then much. you'll have to tell me every, every time what to do. Yeah. Okay, so um, thank you very much, Alexander, and good evening, everyone. Good evening. I say evening because it's 8 p.m. in Moscow, and I'm having my evening coffee. Um, thank you very much to the organizers for the opportunity um, to present at this seminar. It's a great honor for me. I'm not going to talk about my life story, as it's unremarkable, apart from the two episodes when I met Professor Fogel in Harvard and Washington, I believe. Um, and we also had a seminar of our own with Professor Vogel just the other day, so now it almost looks like there is a sort of exchange going on. Um, I can also see some familiar um, names among the participants, but I can't see your faces. Thank you all very much for your time anyway. Um, I'll try to be more concise in order to leave more time for discussion. Um, so, Russo-Japanese border dispute. Um, Vladimir Putin and Shinzo Abe met, I believe, um, 27 times altogether, and the last one was at the Eastern Economic Forum in uh, Vladivostok. Um, the um, long-standing dispute between the two continued to be an issue, um, but the dialogue also showed that the two are willing to uh, emphasize strategic importance of strengthening political and economic relations, Uh, between the two countries and work on the joint projects and and so forth. But the um, the territorial ish the territorial dispute um, didn't really um, come up uh, to an extent that the issue became that the populations of both countries have lost faith in the matter ever reaching a productive resolution. So, according to recent polls, um, three quarters of the Japanese 
do not believe in any progress achievable in negotiations, um, yet they think that the negotiations should be um, continued in order to either return the territories to Japan or compromise on the transfer of the islands um, of Konoshir and Uturup immediately. Um, and the talks continuing over the other two islands in the future. So that's 40% of the population. Um, at the same time, the overwhelming majority of Russians are against even considering the transfer of territories to Japan. Um, and as Alexander pointed out, the actual population of the Kuril Islands um, is itself almost wholly um, united against the notion as they're all Russian um, and or mostly. Um, so experts have argued that um, putting an end to disagreements with Russia over the islands would enable Abe's government um, to pursue a more independent foreign policy line. Um, this has indeed been one of his key goals, um, especially uh, when he was proposing a referendum on Article 9. Um, it could have resulted in um, uh, all sorts of interesting developments. However, now there is a likely change of leadership in Japan, um, with Abe possibly withdrawing his candidacy from the next election. Um, a transition to power should have happened when he stepped down in the fall of 2021, but obviously the pandemic and the resulting postponement of um, the Olympics um, have drastically altered all the calculations. Um, but um, nonetheless, um, regardless of who becomes a um, new leader, um, a strong relationship with one of the region's largest actors would certainly help um, balance out um, nearby growing China and its worrisome influence and that Japan is concerned about. So this is something that Tokyo has um, voiced concerns about, particularly in recent years, um, especially after China overtook Japan and became the second largest economy in the world, ending um, a four decade long reign um, and taking the number two spot that Japan occupied. Um, so Russia, for its part, could also um, potentially use a solid partner in Asia um, in order to uh, counter the accusations that its turn to the east is, in essence, actually a turn to Beijing. Um, so the reality is that both could actually benefit from this partnership. However, um, ending this territorial tug of war, would it necessarily lead to a breakthrough in bilateral relations? Um, we're not sure um, who the new leader will be, and a lot will depend on that, obviously, but the current dynamics between Russia and Japan present this kind of um, chicken and egg dilemma. Is it the territorial dispute that holds back the two from strengthening and diversifying co cooperation? Um, or is it the ties themselves that need a major boost and a series of mutual concessions before there can be any progress? So Alexander and I argue that it's the latter, so um, the relations <laughs> need a boost. Um, and um, in this respect, it's quite meaningful that Alexander drew on a case um, of another long-standing dispute um, in the region, which was successfully resolved. Now, um, I'm by no means suggesting that there is a sort of triangular dynamics going on here. However, I suppose it can be used as an example. Um, so the Russian-Japanese territorial problem certainly has differences with the Sino-Soviet and Sino-Russian one. Um, so um, just um, to look at history a little bit. So due to the um, 1855 Treaty of Shimoda, um, which established the borders between the two empires. Japan officially used to have control over um, Kunashi, Iturup, Habamai, and Shikatan, um, while the remaining Kuril islands, they went to Russia, and the status of Sakhalin was undetermined. Um, the Treaty of St. Petersburg um, of 1875 confirmed that Sakhalin was Russian territory and that all the Kuril islands, including the now disputed four islands, once again belong to Japan. Um, now, this wasn't a great trade deal using Trump language <laughs> um, because Sakhalin was practically a Russian territory anyway, but um, either way, um, but, so according to this treaty, um, Sakhalin de Jura now belonged to Russia. And there was the Treaty of Portsmouth as well, obviously, um, at the end of the Russo-Japanese War that gave Japan the southern part of Sakhalin as well. Um, so I think it's the next slide now. After the defeat in the Second World War, 
Um, Japan had to renounce all its occupied territory under the Treaty of San Francisco, um, 1951, with the Allies. It also renounced um, all uh, claim to the Kuril Islands, um, as well as the other possessions that included Sakhalin, for instance. And um, the Soviet Union incorporated the Kurils, um, including the isles of Kunashir, Uturu, Pabma, and Shikatan, into its territory, deported the existing Japanese population. Um, however, Japan did not really recognize these four islands as um, being part of the Kurils and claim them back. So um, the diplomatic ties between the two were restored by the Soviet-Japanese Joint Declaration of 1956. I believe it's the next slide as well. Um, and um, there were a few clauses. The first one clearly expressed the joint will of both countries to end the war. Um, and it said the state of war between um, the USSR and Japan shall cease on the date on which the declaration enters into force. Um, this fact is um, quite frequently left out um, when um, experts provide historical background on the dispute, implying that the state of war between the two countries has not formally finished. Um, and there was an Article 9 as well um, of the document that also expressed the will of the USSR to cede the Habamai Islands and the islands of Shikatan, but the states um, that the actual transfer of these islands to Japan will only take place after the conclusion of the peace treaty between the USSR and Japan. However, as we know, the treaty was never signed. Um, the main reason um, for that um, was the Treaty of Mutual Cooperation and Security between the, the US and Japan. Um, according to Moscow, that changed the strategic situation in the region and um, made the original pledge void. Um, the US put pressure on Japan as well and advised against a territorial compromise with Moscow under the threat of um, terminating economic aid and retaining Okinawa. Uh, now, another reason was um, arguably growing nationalism in Japan. The Japanese government is often accused of uh, not being very consistent in denouncing its military past, oftentimes at the expense of healthy relations with its partners in East Asia. Um, Experts claim that certain anxious episodes um, of wartime history are understated or covered up. Um, and um, there was a Russian diplomat uh, called Vitaly Vorobyov who participated in the um, Sino Soviet Sino Russian border dispute resolution, who argued that um, a dominant narrative in Japanese post war policymaking uh, was the victimization um, of Japan at, at the um, hands of the rest of the world. Um, so the territorial dispute in this sense um, fits well um, in this framework and it has sort of become a national symbol of unfair treatment by the winners of the war. Um, this explains why Japan um, often uses the phrase returning um, the isles and restoring justice um, in the world order. Um, for Russia, as a successor of the Soviet Union, ceding the territories would obviously mean the uh, opposite of justice. It would be revising the results of the war um, as a potentially dangerous uh, practice um, and could lead to problems, um, not only with Russia, that is, uh, not only with Japan, that is, but also other places of the world. Um, so I think is the next one. Yeah, at present, Russia is, um, seems to be ready for a compromise. Um, its official position is to hold dialogue uh, based on the joint declaration, uh, the Sino-Soviet, uh, uh, pardon, Soviet-Japanese uh, joint declaration of 1956. Um, and um, the Sino-Russian model here actually shows that specific border arrangements can be negotiable depending on the circumstances. Um, but one thing is clear, nobody gets all or nothing. Um, therefore, um, this, uh, yeah, this is what Putin referred to as the Hikiwaka principle on multiple occasions as well, um, which means that um, it's a draw. Nobody gets um, everything. It's, there's no clear winner or loser in this situation. Um, Japan's position, however, um, so I think it's the next slide as well. Um, Japan's position here um, suggests quite little um, desire to compromise. Um, and Tokyo 
um, demands that Moscow recognize, well, frequently demands that Moscow recognizes um, Japanese sovereignty over all four islands, um, or transfer two to Japan immediately and continue negotiations on the remaining two. Um, so the position has already uh, resulted in failure on multiple um, occasions. Uh, the most recent one being um, in December 2016 um, in Yamaguchi. Um, now, more recently, it seems that um, the general approach under Abe has shifted slightly. Um, so there was a statement in Osaka um, during a meeting with Putin in, in 2019 was another indication of that. Um, Tokyo seemed at that point more inclined to support Moscow's approach. Um, and um, Lavrov uh, was also, um, well, Lavrov clearly formulated his position in, in, in 2019 when he said that um, any agreements should be supported and accepted by people and parliaments of Russia and Japan. Um, and he also said that the path to um, improving, the path to um, to improving relations between the two countries uh, lies um, in um, comprehensive development and cooperation in all areas. And um, so this is the kind of approach that also enabled Russia to resolve its issues with China. Um, and um, according to some, it might even influence other border disputes, um, such as the Sino-Indian one. Um, and it already led to significant growth in bilateral trade, for instance, and broadened um, political dialogue between Moscow and Tokyo. Um, the two countries' leaders, they continue meeting, well, not in the current circumstances anyway, but they used to <laughs> continue meeting um, and um, talking about um, fostering political dialogue in all spheres, including security, um, and, um, well, as we said, but bilateral trade was growing as well. Um, the situation is still, um, even though there are all of these developments, it's still, still rather far from the ideal. Um, but the overall trend um, is encouraging, I would say. Uh, when I presented in Tokyo in January, um, there were lots of um, participants who expressed um, a lot of hope regarding the potential resolution um, of the issue. Uh, but now, as I've said multiple times, with the potential change of leadership in Japan, the prospects um, remain a bit of a mystery for us. But I would say with the current general stalemate um, in bilateral relations, a settlement is unlikely to happen very soon, but um, we can hope for the best and we can um, ask the audience what they think. Um, thank you very much. That will be all. <coughs> Thank you so much to both of you for giving us a very clear presentation. And I think I speak for many of us in saying that we have not studied these issues in detail at all and are very appreciative that you laid the things out so clearly and so informative and in such a scholarly way. I have two questions. Uh, one, uh, I take your point that um, the improvement of relations uh, is what lays the background for territorial disputes rather than the other way around. And given the fact that Japan now has begun to have doubts about the United States-led uh, world order, do you think that uh, that uh, context, that Japan... Uh, uh, being able to be less re reliant on the United States will lead them to be somewhat more flexible uh, in opening up uh, and expanding relations with other countries, including Russia. And do you think that's a major factor uh, in uh, ma making the changes that would lead to border disputes? So that's the first question. The second question is, why is the border itself so important? Is it really a major geostrategic issue or has that just become a symbol for uh, other, other relationships? Or are there important geostrategic reasons why those four islands are so important? So 
Uh, we'll start off with those two questions and then we'll throw it over to the audience. Can I just start with the second one? Sorry. Um, it um, sort of seems like it's um, more of a, it's, it's a secret <laughs> suggestion rather than a question. <laughs> um, I think history always... Um, I'm not suggesting. Pardon? Oh, sorry. Um, so yeah, so um, I think um, there's um, more often than several times in history, it happens that uh, certain disputes are being used for um, certain purposes, <laughs> let's put it this way. And I think it could be argued that um, this has become a symbol um, in the bilateral relations in a way. Um, however, because um, of the negative connotation it's uh, so closely associated with. Um, I do think that both countries should work towards a possible resolution um, and maybe get rid of this sort of even stigma in a way. I don't, I'm not even sure how to phrase it properly, but um, I think um, we should move towards, towards overcoming this whether it's a symbol or not. Um, if Alexander has anything to add on that. Well, border issues sometimes are important and sometimes are not. Uh, it depends on the government quite a lot. For example, in Japan, I'm quite sure that all these issues could, could have been solved right after the Second World War. But then Japan kind of Japanese government began this kind of propaganda saying that, you know, because it's basically lost the war, it had to mm, fight for something. So and, and it made this small issue a, a big issue. And now it's, it's, it's very kind of part of Japanese, Japanese national, na national thinking. In Russia, it's uh, the ge general idea that gaining more territory is good is still there. But I think that a strong leader like Putin, for example, could have, could, can explain to its people the necessity of, you know, of a settlement if he really wanted to. But he could not lose his face, as Ch Chinese people say. Uh, so he, he, he cannot uh, give everything to Japan. There should be a settlement, right? Uh, like, like in the case of China, because in, in in the case of China, there was the there were a lot of there was a lot of criticism in Russia uh, of the deal, and even some criticism in China. Well, of course, in China, it's difficult to find out, but still, some people criticize it, and you can, if you check the Chinese internet, you still can find some criticism of that deal. Uh, but, uh, you know, democracy is not, is not good here for, for solving such issues. You know, Japan is probably too democratic for that. Okay. We're now open to further questions. So, uh, Nick, do you want to uh, take over and uh, accept questions? Sure, I'll jump in here. Um, so our first question that's coming is from uh, Dong Wang. Uh, would the Ailand Islands solution help solve the Russian-Japanese border dispute? Uh, both Japan and Russia played a role in that episode of history. Oh, that is the, uh, the dispute between um, Sweden and Finland, right? Um, you know, I'm afraid we're not <laughs> specialists on that, but I believe it had mostly Swedish population, right? Um, well, frankly, we're not great experts on that. Also, I know Olga lived in, in Finland for some time. And so, but, but maybe did as well, if I'm not mistaken. Is that right? Or can we not hear the participants? I don't think. Um, yeah, we can't hear the participants, though I do have a, a notice in my chat that says that yes, this, that you're, you're correct into which situation. <laughs> and my pronunciation may just be totally off too. Yeah. <laughs> so that's your teacher, actually. 
I, I think so, yeah. So I spent a year in Finland as well. So, <laughs> okay. unfortunately, I didn't really um, study that subject <laughs> um, okay. very well. Sorry. No, that's but probably we we wa we wanted to use it in this this Russian Chinese example for other disputes, like between yeah. China and India, for example. I thought maybe Professor Wang has a suggestion um, as to how exactly it could help. Maybe if we could um, ask her to speak, or would that not be an option? Uh, we may be able to get something like that going here. Um, let's see. It's a shame because this is material for another article right there. <laughs> Well, while we're figuring that out, I'll, I'll move on to another question and then maybe we can circle back. Um, Peter Dutton says, to what degree do you ascribe China's willingness to complete border negotiations with China or with, with, with Russia to China's internal decision to advance in the maritime direction and to resolve border disputes to, shifty re to shift resources from land power to begin to develop naval power? What might your answer suggest about Japan? Mm. So do I understand it right that the essence of the question is that um, China's border dispute resolution was in a way an excuse for it to develop militarily? Is this, is this what Peter means? These are excellent questions. Um. Yeah. <laughs> All very Peter, true. Do you want to <laughs> well, Peter, do you want to? We're 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 trying to pull people in to to ask questions. Um, yeah. uh, so Peter says to shift resources here. About oh, he he's just correcting a typo. Um, yeah, we're trying to pull people in to ask the questions live since there's obviously some it would be easier for them to, to respond here. Um, but I think we're having a few few different audio issues. So this is Peter. Can Peter explain? Oh, oh, here we can, uh, Peter, Peter, can we, we can hear you. Okay, thank you, yeah. So um, Taylor Frabel at MIT wrote, um, did some really good work on uh, sort of a, an array of uh, border di resol dispute resolutions that China made in the, in the 1990s and early 2000s. And uh, one of the uh, potential drivers of, of that array of, of, of uh, territorial disputes that were resolved may have been um, China's desire to shift resources toward the maritime direction. Since that time, they've developed quite a lot of naval power and then focused on um, their, their maritime disputes. So I'm wondering if you see that, that strategic shift, um, if you agree that that strategic shift was part of the driver that led uh, China to resolve its disputes with Russia, and might it take a similar kind of strategic shift of some kind for Japan um, to be in a, uh, Japan and Russia to be in a position to uh, resolve their disputes? Thanks. Well, do you mean that What's, what, what's sh I'm not quite sure what you mean by shifting resources. Do you mean that the China wanted to settle disputes with some countries like former Soviet, so Soviet states uh, to, uh, to support its expansion to the south? Uh, Essentially, yes. Um, so China resolved almost all of its um, border disputes. Obviously, there are a few remaining in particular India. Um, <clears throat> but they shifted, uh, uh, they, they, they have decreased the size of the army and increased the size of the budget for the, for the um, naval component, uh, uh, both, both the Navy, the Coast Guard, and, and other um, maritime approaches during that time. One of the <laughs> theories has been that, that the reason that the Chinese um, resolved all those, all those border disputes was to be able to stand down territorial tensions um, yes, yes. and the uh, army that was required to support them. Well, I'm not sure it, if it was a kind of strategy, uh, long-standing strategy by China. I would rather say that uh, 
there's a difference between uh, the, the chi Chinese policy changed. It was much eager to settle disputes in the 1980s, 1990s, when it was uh, weaker and basically when it was, uh, you know, more modest, uh, according to Deng Xiaoping's ideas. And it managed to settle a lot of disputes, uh, which were easier to settle with uh, Russia, with Central Asian countries and several others. But because the dispute with India was uh, much more complicated, and especially the South Sea one, they, they, they did, didn't have time to do it at that time. And, they, and then China's policy became much more assertive, China became stronger, and they were not that much eager to settle, to settle this dispute. Uh, so it was not, I would say, a strategy, but it kind of uh, was a process, a natural process. And now it's much more difficult for the Chinese leadership to make, to make concessions like they made uh, to Russia because they, they, they made some concessions. They did not uh, lose everything, but they lose some, some of their, or, or, or like abandon some of their claims. So now for China, they, they again made this uh, South China Sea uh, claims, their claims, they made it like included into, into the principal issues, the basic issues, uh, where there can be no retreat, just like Japan did. So it's now would be much more difficult. Also, the uh, and they did not shift their resources. They just became stronger. Uh, and 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 they ha and now they have much more resources than in the 1990s, or or, or even beginning of this century. And uh, for Japan, I'm, I'm not sure what you mean that Japan can do something like that because Japan is not planning to expand in any direction. As far as I know, they have a lot of internal problems. So I don't think Japan can do anything like that. Japan needs a settlement with Russia for you know, much more different reasons. Uh, Japan wants to pursue a more independent policy from the United States, also not completely independent, but kind of more, more nationalist and more, uh, more independent. And Japan needs uh, some balance against China's influence. Of course, uh, this, uh, the, uh, the United States is the major, uh, major ally, but to have some more like Russia would not be a bad thing. I think Olga said about it, but in much more kind of, kind of in a more cultured way. Uh, <laughs> right. So it wouldn't be bad for it. So, so the tendency is that you know, both this nationalist tendency and the rising China would work in the direction of, of settlement. But it will, it will be difficult for Japan because it made it such a, such a principled issue. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Professor Wong, I think you should be live here. If you can unmute yourself, you should be able to ask your question. Okay. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Hello yeah. from Northwest. Yes. yes. Yeah. Hello from Northwest Germany. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, my question is actually. Um, um, is the Sino-Russian territorial uh, settlement um, could be a comparable model for the Russian and Japanese uh, territorial dispute? Uh, the second question, of course, it has to do with the very famous island um, uh, islands um, solution in international law and international history. Um, so I'm just wondering if our um, uh, um, speaker of uh, honor uh, could uh, share the insight on this. 
I'm so yeah. sick. Uh, are extremely I think, I will rule that, <laughs> I think I'll rule it that we have so little time. I think that they've already addressed that first question. So I, I hope they will concentrate on the second question. Yeah, thank Go ahead. you. Yes, yeah, so I, I was just uh, going to say that since we are so extremely ignorant uh, when it comes to the matter of the Holland Islands, um, I was wondering what sort of um, insight exactly is Professor Wang is offering us? In what way could this potentially be useful? So this is answer well, to a well, question. Well, let me answer this very, sh very short. Our idea is that the main principle, well, there are two, uh, two principles or two lessons from the uh, settlement of Sino-Russian territory in dispute. dispute. One, the first is that nobody gets everything. It, it should, there should be mutual concessions or in the territorial sense, a division of the territory or some other settlement, like for, for example, territory in exchange of something. Mm -hmm. And second is that the territorial settlement comes after the general improvement of relations. It cannot come first. You need first to improve relations to, re to the level when, uh, when you think that it is the last, or one of the last major obstacles to further improvement or further development of relations. And then it becomes a, 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 a small, but uh, kind of a small irritant in your relations, and then and then and, and then you are inclined to to settle it somehow, uh, some sometime soon. So this is this is the general idea we can give. But of course, we don't know the details of this European uh, U, 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 European conflicts, and I think they are not very. I mean, within the framework of uh, you. European Union, you, they, are, they are not that uh, that serious, actually. Oh, there are some serious uh, disputes, like uh, uh, like this between Spain and England, for example, or Spain and Britain, uh, but but not many. I think we have time for just one more question, uh, and uh, who would like uh, Nick? Yeah, so since we've been pulling in people to ask their own questions, we're going to we're going to pull in Noriyuki Shikata from the US Japan program here at Harvard. Um, so Nora, you asked two questions in the chat. If you could just pick one of them since we've only got time for one more. Um, that'd be great. We're going to make you a panelist here and you should be able to ask your question momentarily. Shikata san is a Japanese diplomat. Okay. So is he going to hear me? Okay. Go ahead, yes, Nuri. Go ahead. Nuri, you got it? We may be having some technical difficulties. Well, here's the question. Do you have a text to the question, Nick? Uh, yes, sure. Um, I'm, okay. As I said, as I said, there are two questions asked, so I'm not not sure which uh, Nori would have would have chosen, but I'll go with the first one. As was referred to in Olga's slide, the Treaty of Shimonoseki in 1855 confirmed the border between Etorofu and Urupu, Northern Territories, consisting of four islands, um, which had never been held by foreign countries, including Russia, before August 1945. Does Russia reject this historical just fact? Just a second, hey, Nori's on. Nori, can you talk now? Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, so uh, I had some difficulty. And uh, so, so this is uh, as related to uh, the Treaty of Shimono Shimonoseki. And uh, Olga's uh, slide uh, actually mentioned it. And I think it's a very important treaty. And uh, there is no basic conflict you know, between the two uh, governments at that time uh, in 1855. So I, I'm curious about the uh, uh, Russian view regarding, uh, uh, you know, this, uh, as well as, uh, you know, of course, the uh, Northern Territories were, uh, the, the, the Russian forces came to Northern Territories uh, after, you know, in the end of uh, August and September of 1945. 
after Japan you know, declared uh, the def defeat. So I'm curious about the uh, Russian view. And, and at the same time, uh, recent days, uh, Foreign Minister Motegi has been stressing the importance of uh, continuing uh, negotiation with uh, uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov. And of course, uh, the, the corona is making it more difficult to, to meet. But uh, I guess Japanese side is saying that uh, we are willing to continue negotiation. And the Prime Minister Abe has been really spending a lot of polit political capital for uh, uh, this negotiation with Russia. Um, thank you so much. These are all great um, insights. So actually, I think, I believe the slide was referring to the Treaty of Shimoda rather than the Treaty of Shimonoseki, right? Uh, Shimoda, ex excuse me, Shimoda, yes. yes. Is, uh, I was a little bit confused. <laughs> so, sorry, yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, so the, the treaty um, established in the borders between the two, uh, two empires, right? The, the, um, and Japan officially used to have control over Kunoshiro, Teru, Habama, and Shikatan, right? Mm -hmm. So the question is whether... Uh, so whether you know, Russian viewpoint is uh, the, the kind of... Two, uh, that's uh, a lot of Russian people have uh, complaints uh, about, you know, this uh, legitimacy of... Uh, a treaty of uh, Shimoda, you know, which is a basis for the Japanese uh, government argument. I think the issue is that Russians don't um, look that far back when they are negotiating. So the official position, and Lavrov keeps stressing, as well as Putin keeps stressing the fact that um, the negotiations should be uh, based on the uh, Sino-Soviet, uh, pardon, uh, Soviet-Japanese joint declaration of 1956 rather than um, the Treaty of Shimoda, right? Alexander can correct me. If... Yeah, let me add something. Well, first of all, there's no official position on the Treaty of Shimoda, but it doesn't matter because the Russian official position is basically forget about history. <laughs> the fact that those uh, four islands are Russia, uh, belong to Russia is the result of the Second World War. And we are not going to change the results of the Second World War. And all actually said that. And there was a, another slide there that, uh, because if we begin to change the results of the, so uh, undermine the results of the Second World War, Russia will have a, a lot of other questions problems, border problems with other countries like Estonia, like Germany and others. So you can, in Japan, base anything you want on Shimoda Treaty or any other historical treaty, but Russia would tell you that we don't care basically about who, what, what, what happened in 1855. So that, that, that's the position. <laughs> well, I, I am afraid that time is up. I've let the session go a little longer because of the little technical issues. Uh, but I think all of you can see uh, how informative it is to have somebody who really understands the situation from the Russian point of view and uh, has very high quality uh, scholarly standards uh, to explain these issues to us and that we're very appreciative of uh, Alexander and uh, Olga. And I hope that this uh, link up now will enable some of you to have uh, conversations outside of our forum that in a way I think uh, one of the functions of our session today is to uh, help open the channels for more scholarly exchange between Russian scholars of Asia and uh, our uh, Western scholars and I hope that some of you will continue uh, these contacts uh, as you can see what outstanding scholars we have to work with. So thank you all for your participation. Thank Nick and Mark for your technical uh, work. And uh, uh, let's continue these conversations.